So I'm coming back to the story how I met Francesca because I think she's doing something magnificent for dentistry, something that many times for many, many years we tried to achieve and we couldn't get it. We, we couldn't break that wall of connection between restorative dentistry, top level, high-end protocols in prostorontics versus rational occlusion in the way that we think. And I think Francesca was able to have that totally control, the reputation, the beautiful dentistry that she practiced, and allows the world to finally get the respect to start listening about an occlusion that breaks paradigms. So the background from Francesca, she's a top level prostorontics, doing prostorontics in the regular way for many years, but he has one plus that starts changing the dynamics of her life and the dynamics of the perception that the dental community start accepting. It. The first one is she start training with Professor Pascal Magné in adhesion, and I think that create the first adhesion, the first bonding connection with this reputation to have an amazing dentistry. So Francesca is the kind of dentist that every radicular root tip the potential to make an amazing 20 floor building because it's all about that issue. And also she's a well defender to don't prep teeth, to preserve the structure of the enamel and to keep the conditions of the bonding in the best way as an important to preserve the vitality and the success of the restoration. That's what I call top end dentistry. And after this, she get inspired, I don't know how, that is what she's gonna tell us. And she get totally out of the, 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 the box. So I was seen in a Queen's Test and a Ceramic Symposium, and I see this doctor showing cases with worse dentition breakage than we have in patients with pain. Patients with no teeth, two millimeters, crazy eruption compensations, totally bruticism that I don't think we even get to have those cases here. And then I think that she's open vertical dimensions dramatically, but the most important is she never even mentioned how she take the bites, but you see that the mandibles, they wasn't in a posterior position, wasn't not in an habitual central relation. And you can see physiologic decompensation and she was building on that. So when she finished the lecture, I just grab her for the hand and I walk with her and I say, Francesca, maybe you don't know me, I'm Javier Vasquez. I believe in occlusion and what you just show, you blow my mind. And from there we start this relation. So this is what I want to share with you guys, how she participate in the process of occlusion. She is not a doctor that she treats patients based in pain. So the collection of data that she does is different but it has too, more, too much more that we as a dentist, the one that we are in the other side, we need to know. We need to know how magnificent, uh, uh, magnify dentistry, to how to preserve adhesion, how to preserve and stop being mutilating cases by aggressive restoration. So now I don't gonna talk more. I let you Hamid and, and Francesca Francesca, well, all, tell us about that story. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for making the time to join us and, and share some of your uh, wonderful work with us uh, and knowledge. I want to assure you that uh, we don't have a specific mold, as Javier was saying, for the practitioners uh, that we, uh, we asked to, to join us. Um, we just uh, really chose people that we, we thought they're doing extraordinary dentistry and and can add to the discussion. So without any further ado, please uh, 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 go ahead and, and let us. Tell us a little bit about that. How would you start? Because it's easy to do good dentistry. Everybody is oriented to do uh, a smile design, digital planning. So we're taking advantage of those tools today to facilitate predictability into the cases. Tell us about a little bit about that importance in adhesion that I think, at least in the community that we are around, we see, and mostly here in America, is a lot of lack of isolation, for instance, when we do bonding. And 
how here eventually we're a little more aggressive in preparations, mostly because maybe we don't implement that much about the adhesive. So what I wanted to tell us is how that is so important and how was that connection for you into function and how one day you decide, you know what, this doesn't make sense, this is what I'm seeing and this is how we're gonna start doing it. Because after that you build that, I will tell the story that happens when you were taking the courses with me in Dijon and how blow away I am in the way that you take your bites that is so close to the bites that we take. So let's go just by, by steps. But I don't hear you. Francesca. No, 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 you can no, hear yeah. me. Can no, you? yes, yes. 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 <laughs> um, the story is that I was trained as a, a prostodontic because I was wearing braces all my life. I really wanted to become an orthodontist, but I love the laboratory of the pros, imagine. So I was always doing laboratory stuff and I went to pros. But when I decided to go back to Europe, I was coming to Europe as an ITI implant scholar. Can you oh, believe wow. I was totally into another direction, was placing implant and do classic uh, substructive prosthodontic. But I knew I was not so happy. It was not good in my hands. I was enough good, but nothing special. And I felt that there should be something different. So the, my completely blow up my moment was with Pascal Magnet because I was out of the boat for two months in Geneva. I was supposed to place implant. They never saw me in the surgical department. I never went there, but instead I just aspirated to Pascal Magnet and I was asking questions like uh, uh, tubula, dentin bonding i didn't know and <laughs> nothing and he was so kind to answer my question because i was really level zero of adhesion i was bonding with zinc phosphate oh. uh, so imagine and uh, uh, when he left because after 18 years he decided of course to go to uh, los, los angeles i was there and from the day left, the second day, I went and I was the dentist that had to treat Pascal Magne patient, the dentist that had to take care of a Pascal Magne student at the University of Geneva. Everything happened with adhesion and veneers that was not working at the University of Geneva. They were asking me and oh. everybody was asking me that in French that I was not speaking <laughs> one word. So <laughs> for, I think for four months, I was uh, only studied the book of Pascal, emailed to Pascal and said, Pascal, help me. But I felt that I, I finally, I found the tools because I was, I love my prosthodontic training for the laboratory, the wax up, I love it, the global vision. But what I didn't like was these irreversible mm, tools because they don't allow you to make a mistake. That is the beauty of additive prosthodontic. Every time I decide to treat the patient in these uh, not invasive, no minimal invasive, not invasive, zero. I always have in my mind, if it doesn't work, I remove everything. So this is, was my first initial going into the function. Because if I was treating this uh, eroded patient, yes, I was reconstructing their mouth. Uh, but after that, I start to get other patients. They were looking at me and they say, do you have another solution? I'm like, yeah, let's try. So that's what it happened. But I was just to say, well, with the, this protocol, it's called the three step, I can really decide for each patient how to build what I call a try in, a test drive, all additive that the patient should wear it's perfectly bonded, even on top of existing restoration. And that is for me what was my eye opening because, because I stopped to anesthetize my patient while I was doing this uh, occlusal classic stabilization. I had people telling me, 
but I don't like this. I don't like that because they were totally aware and they were also sitting on an upright position, never like this, because it was at the end of the session. And after I remember this girl that came, I was doing the classic uh, occlusal adjustment and that was the end of the day. And she asked me these uh, powerful tools and say, can you give me a gum? Just by, just, I just finished to bond the veneers and it was just a very little overjet, overlap, nothing. So she was ready to go home and she started to chew. My stuff already left. I was by myself. It took me more than one hour with the gum to make her comfortable because the way she was chewing was completely unexpected to me. And with the regulation, the classic going from in, out, nothing applied to her. And so that's why I start to give this chewing gum to my patient to check for uh, the capacity of my restoration to fit, because we as a dentist are always uh, want that this restoration lasts a long time. But I realized that not only I was finding conflict and so removing interference, but I was start to say, hey, but um, if I have to give you a new way of walking, can I just see how you walk in the first place? So I start to give the gum to everybody because it's just a chewing gum, an iPhone, something that everybody can do Monday. And there it blew my mind because I start to see that one was chewing one way, one is what chewing the other way. And I start to ask while I was doing the video to people. And so if you ask me the question, who teach me the neatology that I do? My patient, my patient, because I learn to observe things that I was not observing when I was in my classical training because I was reading literature how the mouth should work but I was not really looking at people working and so at the end I learned that there is a variability and I learned the limit of me as a dentist but I learned the huge potential that we can have not only to avoid to create a damage. And so from the additive adhesive, I was already into the preservation, maximum preservation. But also I say, you know what? If I put this uh, increase of vertical and the first thing the patient tells me is uh, I can breathe. I say, well, I, you know, I have a good spoon every time I think about this patient. Mm -hmm. So that's you know, I have a medical degree before a dental degree. So that's blow my mind because I say, wow, they always think about the dentist as a, a narrow person looking at the, to fix the holes and to remove infection. And now I can make these people better. So there I start to do killing my ego. <laughs> because that's why this year at the symposium i'm not invited a year I know. I knows because i was there with killing my ego for the aesthetic and things look fantastic because they function fantastic but they are not interesting in movement they are interesting in the the final symmetric one way fit all and yeah. we are people that don't fit in that system because we do in the name of the patient. So for me, first the patient, after my human uh, experimentation, my research, and after that, my publication and blah, blah. But nowadays, I don't publish anymore because my case are less uh, glamour because I, I am less uh, over treatment and less uh, pushing the smile of uh, everybody for every age no now the the second topic the hot topic is uh, yes but uh, which is the physiology for that specific patient so we have to aim is he already in a physiological chewing pattern do we need a can we modify and can this modification will last uh, 
in time with the aging of the patient. So this is bringing so much power, but also the concept, I am really aware that I cannot do miracle, but I can avoid to do damage. Yeah, that's... No, so, uh, so far what I'm seeing is, and the main point is, because you relate more with that uh, restorative doctor, that maybe they even know that canine guides or articulator is not enough, but they don't want to dig in information anymore. So I think you that point of connection about a restorative doctor that they consider that the rational part of what we do, they connected with signs and symptoms, that connected with our full body as an entire unit, is overwhelming. What I like from you first is that uh, you open-minded. Uh, you were so open-minded that I'm nobody for to have you in my course. And you, when I took my course, I have to come the, back. The John. <laughs> but that was beautiful that you get exposed to a really the rational thinking we do, and then you were able to connect into that. And we have magnificent, magnificent conversations about it because with all these cases that you will show us in the marathon, that the people is going to realize how dramatic are the enamel augmentation that you do in these cases, how conservative they are, and how they have amazing results. That's like the connection point that I want to make for this. I want the people to be being scared to modify uh, the occlusions into the patient and just get out of the traditional manipulation because that's the main point. So I'm going to tell you a story that is a true story with Francesca and I when she was taking level two in France in Dijon with me. We were talking how we take neuromuscular bites, how we take cranial bites, uh, utilizing the tens and everything. So we practice in groups. So she was practicing with another doctor. We get the chance to take bites for Francesca, but also Francesca brought her own bite. And it shows me how is the process that she take the bite registration into the patients. It's something that many other uh, physiologic doctors take care in consideration. But at the point that I want to do here is how important is to start thinking out of the box. She combines the walk into the patient, uh, into the office with cotton rolls and in the way that she made the technique because she really pay attention and this is the most important part, to pay attention to the patient and connect to try to find out what is the common pattern to get that information to say, hey, this body needs to be around this. So long story short is she took the patient, the, the, the bite in her weight to the partner that she was working into the case. And then I took my bite. We get the two bite registration. We measure with calipers. We make lines for the vertical, for the AP shift. And I can tell you the bites were almost identical. So it's a bite that is just based in full observation, no bio, biometrics, no transelectrical stimulation, just trying to catch the beauty of the body, of course, you need to be a good observer to be able to see that. And then just develop the skills to try to get it together. But the beautiful point is that now she can see that she was going in a great direction. And since there, she's more inspired to know a little more about that rational part that is to understand how it connects. So I let you talk a little bit on that, and then I we no, will continue. What I say is that uh, when people say neatology and myself, uh, we were like, oh, no, I just do aesthetic. I want to tell you, everybody, nobody does only aesthetic. So we don't have the possibility to skip function. And that's why I like to test each patient in a way that I can... Uh, modify, but I go not with the uh, many tools that uh, Monday another dentist cannot uh, use because I want to go back like I always bother people around me. I want that so many people 
go back to see neatology. But this, if you do with the patient helping you, because the patient will tell exactly which is the uncomfortable part of what we have created in the teeth. But to do so, you need a patient that is not anesthetized. And many times my patient tells me, hey, but uh, my dentist, my previous dentist just told me, go home and get adapted. I don't let yeah. this happen. So for me, the feedback of the patient is the most important thing. It's a, a haute couture, like a dress. So I work with composite, but it's not that I stay in composite, but I don't move to ceramic if I am not sure that I provide the patient with the best fit for that mouth. And uh, while I'm doing that, I also start to look at which population I'm looking at. And uh, as you already say, I don't have any problem to refer a patient to somebody that I think is better than me. So for instance, I refer to Valentin for a cup patients. And I just want to tell you because we need to give protocol to people that listen. So when a patient comes to my office, is not only because they have a worn down dentition. So I am looking at uh, people that are just uncomfortable with their bite. So what I look and I say, where is the margin for me of action? Does it have a good posterior support? Because if it does not have a good posterior support, let's uh, give that posterior support because for me is a must. I am tired to see mock-up of six anterior teeth in people that don't even have uh, the premolar. Uh -oh. So this is set to failure because if you don't even have premolar and you give a chewing gum to these people, you will see that they chew on the front teeth. So those front teeth, uh, they are meant to have the incisal edge flat so they can be transformed in an occlusal surface. And we are not talking about overloading the, the TMJ. We are talking about that the dentists nowadays are so concentrated to the survival of the restoration. Instead, I'm more attached to the patient attached to my restoration. So it's a, it's a different <coughs> deal that I do with these people. So posterior support. So if I see that the posterior support is lacking, I don't start with other people in my team. I, I'm a dentist. I, I make sure that this person has a good posterior support. After that, I want to see, does he have any garage car discrepancy? And you see that with this madness that we have created, with this uh, rejuvenation of the smile, we see people that I define explosive in the way they are aging with this wall syndrome. So it means that there is a functional conflict in the dynamic when they chew, when they speak. And with the gum, you can see immediately that there is no way that you can only repair six teeth. You do a mock-up, give a gum, and you know that the patient will bang. So that, I take care of that. How do I take care of this wall? I have to go and open the garage by a test drive, everything additive. I open up and see the feedback of the patient. While I'm open up, I can even see, do I have to open in the same direction? Because we always have, uh, like Rocabado see this uh, one uh, vision. I think about the mandible three-dimensionally. So I see that many of my mandible are, don't need to be open like this, boom. They need to be open and change the torque because the Correct. torque is something that... You do good. think about the joint. I do, but uh, I don't yeah. do <laughs> instrumentation that I cannot do on the desert island. So that's oh, okay. why I love Yeah, but you say that you carry the, the, the iPhone today, you say, so Correct. you carry an iPhone no, no, and a chew gum. I'm just document, making light of the previous comment. I will comment. document, and that's why our goal is, uh, okay, so let me go to the face. I am in phase three. Let me say what are the phase, because each dentist should understand in which phase is. Phase one dentistry, dentist is the one that receive a patient and the incisal edge are broken and just look at them. And it will most probably redo this incisal edge without thinking 
even at the level of the teeth, if there is something else that they can do. Phase two dentist was me with the three step that I was saying, oh, if there is no space, let me increase the vertical dimension to reconstruct without cutting this remaining tooth structure. Phase three, it's me today. I not only open, but after that, uh, my goal today is to take asymmetrical, asymmetrical structure that, because I treat an adult population. I cannot change so much what has been developed in years of malfunction, of unilateral function, for example. But my goal is to do the way that they open up their motion they start to move and they move in a symmetrical way, bilateral way of chewing. And some people will say, oh, Francesca, you give too much uh, space to chewing. Yes, you know why? why? We are not moving the mouth. We are not eating, we are not breathing, we are totally hypotrophic. And so now I want to share with the world, I don't know if there is a world listening to me, but I want to share something that is uh, something that everybody is making fun of me. You have to know that I think uh, there are two ways of chewing. One is uh, the good way that is horizontal, but if you go more wider, you become a ruminant. And uh, we want to be omnivore, but there is a cycling. And this cycling, imagine how it's good for the TMJ because has this motion that alternate on one side and the other side. And you see this mouth that they breathe, the gingiva is fantastic because my way of observing the gingiva nowadays is totally different. It's, it's to, my restoration is good. The gingiva are happy and healthy. If I don't do well, that would be the first uh, thermometer of my mistake. Anyway, so this type of chewing, with the freedom of moving. It's com is opposite to people, and this is us, because unfortunately myself, I, be, I am like this. Vertical chewer, open and close, the chopping people. Mm -hmm. So if you see kids are all vertical chewer, narrow, they don't develop a, a, a centrifugal force, they are collapsing, everything is closing down, the tongue is claustrophobic, the lips are tight, they are clencher. And so what do we do? We have to train. This is an important tool, cost thousands of euro. So every day I put this one in my mouth, is a caoutchouc from a baby toy. So I hope it's not so plastic, it's a little bit less. So I go in this one and I reproduce the chewing pattern that I cannot do because I don't have food that will allow me to really do exercise. And I don't have the teeth position in this possibility of chewing. Because unfortunately, I have been treated in an orthodontics beauty, but it didn't work. Nobody at the end of my ortho give me a chewing gum and say, you are beautiful, but you don't dance. So that's what I, will, I wish for the orthodontics and for the prosthodontics to check that at the end, this beauty that we give, this alignment that we give, it's good. Because you know how my condal are, completely broken. I went and do an MRI, but I need, do I need an MRI? No, I can already see. And so every day I check, I do this motion that for me is the correct motion in moving this articulation also. And you know what, even more crazy, and I know that people will get after me like uh, they went after me when I say, let's stop touching teeth. These little things, it stimulated my periodontal tissue. The mm -hmm. way we stop doing, because nowadays the only people they are really stimulating are the grinder. But the clencher, clencher are not doing correctly. We have all these fiber aligned in a correct way. And when you see people vertical, they just slam their teeth one against the other and the perio is really stressed. When you have this uh, way of chewing, you enter 
and you are so nice to carry out by the teeth. And that's why I'm really, really looking forward to hear Milieu, they will talk about Marcel Legal that I want really to thank because these were my intuition with my patient, they see them chewing and Milieu met me and say, hey, but you know, there is this guy, they spoke exactly like you. And I say, thank God, because being the first one, is not good because nobody give you credit. So, but uh, no, 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 no. Actually, uh, it's very interesting that you brought. I mean, yesterday we had a, a excellent discussion with Dr. Rockabato, and the very first thing he said, he said, "Why is the, everybody looking at the vertical and, and opening?" He said, "We need to learn and check the excursive movement first." So, I'm I'm actually hearing a lot of resonance in what you're saying. And, but and I need, seriously, I have to say, if you take, so let's go a G test, you take a gum that is not the, the one, the hard one, and smaller you make it, better you could see why. Because I don't want food. In my private practice, I cannot have food that uh, how much can swallow the patient is dirty. This one can be reusable. I check, right. so I normally I take half of them and I ask the patient put in the mouth and when they place it, they always place in the side that they prefer and I let them chew and after that I start to check how they chew because you could see, but people don't know how to do this G test because for instance, they place like a, a retraction cheek. Instead, you see, I went on the right, the right is my preference. So they start to chew, and uh, you let them go and forget that they have a gum. And you will see not only conflict, but unfortunately what uh, Marcel Legal has shown me, the importance of the first molar to direct the jaw. And how many times the first molar is uh, uh, not them. present, absent. Is, <laughs> absent, is not with the correct uh, compensatory curve, Spare Wilson. So get the gum. Yeah, but that also is related with the position where the mandible is. So I think you make an amazing point. Um, function is vital. Is something else in particular that you're gonna teach us about the G test? See. Okay. Okay. So we want to know that because we need to come back some some structural questions. Just because now we know. But let's uh, say let's say we combine. So mm -hmm. let's say that I receive a patient and I see that I cannot do anything from the teeth point of view because teeth is my, sorry, from, um, teeth is my place. So if I see a patient and I see that I have perfect teeth, I could do ortho, but even ortho can mess up a patient because not many, That's unfortunately, because. orthodontics oh, yes. are following <clears throat> the final goal as improved function. I don't want yeah, to- Yeah, they're retruding. Uh -huh. So if I see this patient, like the patient that I uh, sent to Valentine, she's a young individual. She has a perfect teeth, posterior support, uh, teeth that could be even aligned correctly. She chew not correctly. She, mm -hmm. The mandible seems uh, okay because with my cotton walk, the programmation. In the first visit, I look at her. She is this, uh, posture like this, send back, send to somebody that will take care of a posture first. So that's my way of diagnosis, which is my 70% that I will take it and I will work at the tooth level. There is a 30% where I don't see a dental problem, but where I see a dental problem, we can do miracle. And if we reactivate the function of the patient, not only by chewing, but even exercise, because our food does not allow us to really do motion. I mean, how many of us are walking two hours a day? My knee don't move because I'm always sitting. So I'm supposed to do on the trial and do exercise to compensate. But if I was going and walk, uh, uh, be in the, my gardener does not need to go in the gym. We need because we don't do exercise. 
So, the so, so let's wrap a few concepts around it. Some people is asking and saying that who cares about physiology, that the patient wants aesthetics, um, and technically, I think you're the best person to answer this because I can see that you taking care about physiology because you're aware that the patient has breathing better. Second one, because you're the programming the patient and you're making an analysis of the posture as you describe, of the way that you walk. So, of course, you care. So, it's people that cares about physiology. We know the effects in that. And then, of course, you're protecting the case but also you're rebuilding the case in a functional manner. So it's just so a point that I want to create to the, the communication. It's value no, for what we no, do. No, let me answer the question to the patient wants aesthetic. Yes, but how many parents have kids that want Nutella? Patient wants aesthetic. My patient wants aesthetic too, but I am there with the little trick to show them that they cannot have Nutella. So I already show... If you take the patient come and say, I want to repair only the six teeth, and you see that there is no space that you can redo it without creating a locking of this jaw, just take a little flowable, place on the, the lateral, there's many times in this dynamic conflict, polymerize without bonding, and give a gum. And my patient that wants only the six, they start to chew on the other side, and they start to bang on the little repair provisional. And at the end, they say, hey, I hate that. I say, okay, go and break it. And they go like this, they chomp it off. They look at me and say, okay, I know, I cannot have only that. that That's a great a trick. Desert island trick. So, I No, so the point is, yes, you're creating value for the patients. You're creating value and you have, first of all, I think it's many conditions to be able to do physiological dentistry. And doesn't necessarily mean that you need to work with physical therapy, chiropractors, via physical therapy or have instrumentation. Technically, you need to have an open mind to know that it's many dynamic compensations that need to be achieved. We cannot test a car sitting in the garage and you cannot take the car just trying to go in and out one millimeter. You need to expose it to a totally dynamic range of motion. So based on all the information that you gave us, and Hamid, we need to kind of go need fast to, to forward, this. Yeah, we need to go. But, but, but let's, let's try to simplify the question. So, uh, okay. Francesca, don't go to, 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 to a standard in the answers, but we really want that you give us an opinion in the order that we're asking the questions. Um, based on what you say, we know that you're not using complex instrumentation, but we consider the GTS, the current roles, and all that physiologic techniques. I mean, this is... Semiotic. This, we have to start to go back and observe time. Yes, I'm 100%. That's 100 why you need, accept. No, you need to listen to the interview for, for Valentine Breakup. That is the beauty interview that it shows that even though we have all the technology, we're learning to be good diagnosticians. And Correct. that's why in two years, we have no use instrumentation in the courses because we're teaching the people how to diagnose. Diagnostic without tools. Well, this is a, okay. this is an important uh, point. I think uh, instruments uh, help us with giving us data. The diagnosis still has to be done by the physician, and uh, if you are astute enough, observing the patient is still the best. Um, and, and and listen and they, to the patient because many of them tell them the story. It's, but we need patient not anesthetize if we touch them. If we talk Absolutely. about uh, function. Absolutely. the occlusion, of course. Okay, so let's go to the first question. And oh, again, short question. questions. What is the occlusion? Kami, go ahead. All right, so the first question is that what is the occlusion uh, to you and who was your influence? I know your influence already was uh, legal. Like no, Alan. no, no, yeah. my and, and patient, my patient, after patient. that, I found people that tells me, oh, but you do like okay. legal, hey, these things look like planners, but I have people like, right now, I have my little group of research, Confaloni Reali Corti, that you most probably don't know, where we sit, I see their patient, and we do discussion, but with the semiotic, so, I, am, I want to go and see more muscle. We are going into the tongue in the, the sleep apnea, but I'm not the, the person that is there after 20 years. But you will see me for sure 
in the future, I will go back to do simplify protocol because if your colleagues cannot use on Monday, this is not yeah. a real. Message. I totally agree. It's diagnostician. So we will see when we're going to show. And we've been talking about how we're going to build up the four steps together. So we try to simplify because honestly, part of what we teach is use diagnostic. So second question. So which Simple. factors which factors do you consider prior to stabilization? I guess uh, uh, if you give us, I think it's your posterior support for you. Uh, no, because right? if you see the, the way I do the three step, for me is uh, I do both of them. The posterior support, the anterior uh, little touch while they are swallowing, it's a back and forward. So I, it, at the end, my occlusion is built in more steps with the patient comfort guiding me, with the swallowing for the static and with this cotton walk to just uh, make the brain forget about occlusal uh, interference. But from there, my patients do their own adjustment on these, what I call therapeutic bite. That's why I love the three-step that is bonded 24 hours. I need the feedback of somebody yeah. that chew, that swallow all day long. I don't want a removable bite because removable bite, it's not a full picture. True, true. All right. Um, I guess uh, the third question is which of the uh, which type of information diagnostic records do you collect? It depends in which in which patient I have. I in the first visit I want to make a, a simple diagnosis how this mandible is uh, wrongly positioned because of the teeth. I'm not talking about the neck. I'm not talking about uh, the the muscle contraction. I just want to do a quick deprogrammation that is just placing two cotton uh, in between the teeth, making the patient move faster. And I realized that in many cases, I already can see this mandible relax. Mm -hmm. So this is a very little way even to communicate with the patient because the patient must understand that there is not the perfect contact once the, the brain is not there to intercept uh, pre-contact, still at the dental level. And after that, my tools is my three step because it's completed. It really, in two weeks, I have a patient with the new project, a test drive, and it goes with the gum, with, with, the, with the, the feedback of the patient. They walk, they stand up, they do whatever. And it's just a, a like, a, we, we have... A, it's haute couture. So let's say couture that you use you two. Do on, uh, on the mannequin, on the articulator. Is my starting point the articulator. It's dynamics. The patient, patient is, is the articulator. my articulator. Yeah. And, and that's it. When people say, I don't want to do occlusal adjustment, my lab technician should give me everything. I say, mm -hmm. maybe Good in luck. static, maybe in static could be okay. But in dynamic, forget about the articulator. Yeah, totally. So right, then we so, can say, yeah, definitely you're getting information and the records that you collecting are oriented to the dental part. That is yeah. totally valid. Okay, perfect. Fantastic. Now, next question. Next question is, uh, which instrumentation do you currently use to collect the data, which is basically your... Mm -hmm. uh, the gum, the, the gum, the and see, totally, I don't have instrumentation, but I have uh, a, a, a vision that I have two muscle type of, so, so for me, I, I agree with Rocabado, muscle win. In my mind, I have this idea that I'm only a dentist that try sometimes to go against the nature of the patient. And I have two dysfunctional nature. The explosive one, they are guided more by a protrusive attitude while they are aging with the big tongue, even when they speak, they go forward with the S sound and, and they will end up edge to edge. And we, because they, for aesthetic reason, we try to, to give with additive a little bit less uh, to, to slow down this pro process. The second group, are they implosive? So those people, they are really aging with Very the true. mandible that goes back and the maxilla, they ate it up. 
And so these people are much more difficult to, in my opinion, to treat. And those are always, I have the osteopath, but I, I need uh, to have so, first my idea. So I need first to say how much of the dental I can fix. And after that, they go with the osteopath. The osteopath give me a record on the iPhone, my patient come back because it's not in my office, and I hear all the, the if it's getting better, if it's getting worse. So all of my patients have an osteopath, but I, the message is I'm still doing without it because I need to be sure that my part of the job is correct. And you yeah. can really, first of all, don't do damage. That's uh, my goal is that I, the patient that come in my office, they walk away with a better or equal function. And you don't do no harm. No. Um, I think you partially answered the next question, which is uh, yes, it you is. use an interdisciplinary approach and sometimes you do, so you, sometimes you are working with an osteopath. So let's go to question number six. Uh, if you have to establish a sequence of treatment, what would be that order? Uh, that, I guess that would be your three step. You, have, you do have a sequence. I have a sequence where in the three step you give to the patient the aesthetic. But in the first visit is a diagnosis because I need to understand which conflict these teeth are involved. I have a static conflict, I have a dynamic conflict, and there is a little piece of this conflict that I don't have a clue. So what happened is more I become better in diagnosis, more my final diagnosis become a sign. I make a, I, I, I explain myself. If you are, if, the, if your diagnosis is incisal edge break, if you become better in diagnosis, incisal edge damage is a sign. It's not a diagnosis anymore. So right now, my final diagnosis is muscle problem that will give uh, explosion or implosion. Maybe if I enter more in the phase where you guys are, that muscle activated in that specific way will have another reason to be, and there will not be my final diagnosis, will be another sign and I have to work at the other level. Interesting, interesting. Um, the important thing uh, I think we wanted from that also, I failed to mention, was about the, the desired vertical dimension. Now, um, do you choose that uh, based on, I'm gonna go to the next question, which is yeah. facial aesthetics. Do you, do you use or do you choose your vertical dimension based on, uh, let's say, incisal display, gingival display, in other words, facial aesthetics? No, you... I, I want to play the story of the garage. So, so who are the people that come to us to talk about the, the garage door broken? The explosive. Yeah. So if you look at the explosive, the way I interpret them is that their muscle will bring them to age in protrusive. So my way is to try to go against their aging by increasing the vertical, and making again the garage door repair. The mistake that I don't want to do any longer is with these people to make a door that is too close. close because too limiting. what you see with time is that the increase of vertical that I provide to this patient will go back because they are will, also yeah. affected also by wins. clenching. So uh, it's a battle that as a dentist, I cannot really win because I am at the point of my diagnosis that I don't know why they are explosive patients. So that's where I want to investigate why okay. they have this tongue. Well, maybe Rocabado will help me with the muscle underneath the jaw. They will push forward. I don't know. But that's my intelligent way is that when I do mock-up in this explosive patient, the garage is always shorter and flare because mm -hmm. has to be out of the way while the patient will lose vertical dimension and that will close the garage in the anterior part. Fantastic. So I try never to give mock-up 
to this type of population that will make them look 20 younger. I want first to give them a easier aesthetic to carry in 20 years. So you will see that my cases are becoming less glamour because nobody, not everybody can afford the 12 millimeter central incisor. Correct. Correct. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, try to modify next question. Uh, and mm -hmm. I know you do not do any kind of surgery. We can make it use as an opinion because oh, yeah. it's so, additive in everything. So. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, so considering the fact that you do not do surgeries and, and uh, we're keeping that in mind and you do not, uh, at least for now, time being, you do not really look at the joint itself. Uh, theoretically, so speaking, if you knew um, you could actually heal or help or remodel uh, condylar uh, 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 joints by adding um, these biological factors uh, like PRGF and PRP, uh, do you think that would be a good idea? I think uh, as long as I, as a dentist, as a recreate the function, if you put something even more, I don't have a problem with that. My problem is that if we think that only plays in that and have the people not to move. So for me, function win over. If I walk with my knee and I do exercise and I do aqua gym, maybe I don't need the hyaluronic acid inside it, but maybe I am an old patient that needs the aqua gym and the hyaluronic acid. So why not? But it's easier to start with function than to find a surgeon that will do those injections. Absolutely. I think we had consensus on that also with Dr. Raccobato yesterday. And he thought a protective bite, in other words, taking the compression off the joint, which is Absolutely. Kind of what you're doing is critical and, and should be the first step. Basically, when I, when I do the no arm, in my opinion, the mandible that should be centered from a muscle point of view should be all the movement that make this mandible become equal, forward, and large. I like it. Everything that makes my mandible be inside, retruded, and like this, I don't like it because- That is I, clear physiology. That's beautiful. Simplify, yeah. but like that. Because but, we, I mean, we have a claustrophobic tongue. Every ortho, they will make this one smaller. No, no, no. We need to move this you. retruded mandible. Thank you. Thank you. We could not say that any louder, to be honest with you. But this is exactly what this is all about. Finding those, uh, you know, even though you think we may not be doing the same thing, Francesca, what you, when, when you talk, you sound exactly like us and everything you say makes complete sense to us. So these are, this is what we were looking for, for those common grounds and, and finding what it is that you're doing. And, and we're interested because yes, what, what we do, it, it does scare people. And they're like, oh, it's too complicated. And, and how you do it, um, it's so simple and it's- and No, it's, but, but what I need about you guys is that to give a validation to simplify method. So what I mean is that if you are in Africa, you have this nurse they take the baby and they do cholera, malaria, like this. They are fantastic in diagnosis. If you take the same baby and you take to an Italian hospital, a Swiss hospital, they will take hundreds of exams before making a diagnosis. So I need you guys to give validation to this simplicity, this easy way uh, based on observation, based on tools. So at the end, People that want to have a more sophisticated will do the sophisticated, but people that want to start with the GTS, with the true feet, with the, just, the, just the making a film of the patient, they feel they are not just doing a lower quality, they are doing even a lot because Correct. to rehabilitate the patient. Yeah, but it's I, a really important point in what you're saying and because it's a huge difference in population in dentists. Uh, exposed to this situation. So it's going to be the people that they definitely they don't get that involved deep in like the uh, dentistry that we do. But it's the other group that they want, they want to keep it simple and physiologic as you are, 
But it's a group that they just want to know, they don't want to learn anything and they dismiss everything just because it shows complexity and more work. And this is the people that I think it doesn't let the profession to grow. Well, there is I mean, the people that, I mean, I don't think we need to, you know, the, the, the great thing about our, our profession is that you can, you can practice it in all different levels and, and do what you like and, and go after your passion. And there is no judgment about anybody. Uh, but the if only you do audit, you, admit, uh, you have that? this luxury to do mistake. Yeah, at, at that's he said huge. it's huge. That's and right. if you no, have absolutely. this luxury, you do things out of the box. Because I I have people that were supposed to do maxillofacial surgery, and I just end up with the four onlays, and I got the compliment of his osteopath that is. In a, in a clinic in Paris that work with the people that got the maxillofacial surgery and they were not so well like my patient. So we need both of them. No, absolutely. The only stipulation that I see, Francesca, from your methodology is that um, I don't think everybody is, that, is as astute and, and detailed as you are. And the way your eyes have, have trained by just uh, you know, experience, to pick up these things. Um, yeah, but so, that's why we do protocol. That's why we do protocol. That's why we, I, I always, I'm an I'm a Italian and that is my creativity, but I'm totally Swiss. So for everything from the three step to the eight uh, uh, passage of the control visit, so it's all in protocol. That's why I'm looking forward with Javier that he developed this protocol for the phase four. Because people like me, instead of spending 20 years to develop, would like people like him or like you to give direction that Monday we, even though we don't have this uh, view sophisticated, we can do a desert island. On a desert island, I can do a G test on all my patients. I can do a cotton work to all my patients. And I can have a 70% yeah. of the result. That's definitely. That's great. So that's beautiful. That's the point that we were trying to do is that I think the minimal requirement is that at least we have the information. And I think that's the reason that we're doing it here. You don't need to be an expert. You need to be able to identify, know that is going on, give value to that, and just and find your team. And refer. refer, exactly. You don't need to treat it all. You need to be able to identify and be able to refer. Um, it's a fact that the question number 10, Francesca already uh, answered that. Yes. That is, now for you, this is gonna go a little, um, because your academic background. The question number 10 is uh, not objective question, but if you consider that eventually in the universities or in general, we're gonna be able to have a little this view, uh, the more holistic approach, just I that wish, you're really involved in academics. I wish, but it depends on us. It depends on us because I, I, I don't even know how I'm here doing these uh, expert neatologists. Eight years ago, I, I was zero, it, like uh, when I was bonding zinc phosphate with Pascal Magne. So if we can do it, other dentists can do it and it will start to become a necessity for the community but the community don't feel that it is necessary because because we made it so complex that people say forget about it they do very complicated they are no aesthetic and patient would have to pay more and so this is instead when my patient come for the three step they ask me does it hurt no additive let me try does it take a long time for the treatment? No, three steps in two weeks with no anesthesia. Does it cost? No, because I even bond on an existing restoration. So you don't have to do a full mouth, just initial stabilization, a try in, and after we do the upgrade. And you, with my monolithic, I know in front of you I cannot really say that, but I change material for the front. Monolithic, cat cam, palatal veneer that goes with the front and they call it tacos in the name of the Mexican We, we, we love to see that in the marathon. You guys are going to love that technique. Yes. And so this oh. is cheaper. You don't do a crown lengthening, you don't do endo, post and core, different set of provisional. 
you stabilize the patient and you send in the word and say, okay, let's see if this initial is good enough for you. And then we combine it. Okay, the last question is um, something more rational, but I wanna simplify it for you because we're not focused in, in um, x-rays at this point so that you can tell us a position of the condom. But with your background in prostorante, I would love to hear if you have any concerns about that. So the 11 questions say, can you describe the event that happened into the joint in reference with rotation and translation? And it's just to defy okay, to talk I about the dogmas. You, no inch access. You have to know that I have uh, an extremely low level of memory in the sense that everything that they taught me, I forget about if I don't see the pragmacity the, the practical aspect I erase so for me they, they explain how the condo should be I say forget about it I need two different I have adult people the condo are so different what I want is the similar function so I slow down the degradation and these people live a better life so I know that I cannot and I don't like when people say so strict that they have to get an articulator, the condor should be at the same level. No, I want that they, when they are function, they find the minimal um, energy level. The human being wants to work in minimal energy level. And so yeah. that means the muscle the sweet should point. be at Home peace. So this is all common sense, but I honestly, maybe call me in a few years i have not gone outside my competence that is the muscle of the lips the tongue and the muscle of mastication those are the one that i always see if you come out with the protocol i will even record the posture and the turning yeah. of the head because i'm sure in four years i will go back and say Hey, you see how my patient has changed because my yeah. patient tells me that they sleep better at night, that they, they move their head, but I don't record. So I am, I wish I could do that. And in, so that's what we're going to do. And we work, you will see when I do my presentation, the seven steps of uh, uh, data collection. And I you will let you do three steps. Oh. So like, like, okay, uh, condense it. Make it, condense. make it three and a half. Make it, make it yeah. Half okay, the, the last part of that question, and that is really important because you're really into the teeth in the way that you made them touch after that you find what I call the sweet point, and we, everybody will find a different way. Um, so now you find the relationship of the jaws, and then you're building up a composite to create the, what I call adhesive additive occlusion that I think is a beautiful word. Um, and then how is that a scheme of the occlusion contacts? How are you trying when you build in, and now we have CAT CAM, so it's a little more predictable to guide the proper relation. Is your favoritism to use like cause-fossa relationship, cause-fossa uh, uh, interdental space, are you trying my, to balance the loan acts? My, my problem, I tell you which are my problem. My problem that I have a population that is uh, uh, going more and more in class two. So the relation between the first molar in class two is difficult for me to obtain what the milieu will talk about it. Mm -hmm. There is a beautiful harmony between the first mandibular molar that is guided and is uh, mesh against the palatal cusp. So for me, if I have to say my interesting is in the first molar, how legal has a schedule. And I, I, I really, I love it because with people, they have positioned that cusp in the right inclination, the right has, I, uh, height of the cusp. When you ask them to chew, they tell you that they love it. It's comfortable, it's not uh, time consuming. As soon as you verticalize, you lose the Wilson, you, the space co not correct, it's very locked in the young occlusion that now we are giving to everybody, and the patients start to chop. These people, 
if they had been better before, they will break everything and they are classified as a Braxer. And I don't agree with that because we gave them shoes. They are, they are really wrong for the way they function. So they need more comfortable shoes. So for me, the first molar, when I see functioning correctly with this beautiful palatal cusp, when the patient functions, I can see when they cycle, I'm in love with that type of mastication. As soon no, as I see the vertical, uh -huh. I say, ay, 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 this patient is a risk factor for in his right. life for other things that break in the incisal edge. Much yeah, but in, in uh -huh, go ahead. But in the planification of the case in the occlusal relationship, how based, because at the beginning we kind of know the norms and then the experience build that we prepare better for the next opportunity, the next occasion or the next planning of the case. Based on your experience about this setup and what you expect to the patient, what are you doing in advance to make the setup of the relationship of the teeth to avoid to have more interferences? I will tell you like how I describe what I do. I try to have vocal cuts in a, any fossa because I need to have something that it fits, it gives stability for proprioception, mm -hmm. but also I create 15 degrees of entrance and exit into the vocal cusp and into the lingual cusp. So the chewing cycles I'm taking as a consideration how they, they have entrance and exit. Freedom. Like at this and standard moment. for me, yes. And then actually when I was working with Milio and even with you, you guys noticed that in my orthotics is a little less inter interference because I just count into that. So what do you think in these cases in your occlusion, are you trying to do anatomy that they a little more flat? Or how is this in relation in the depth in their cusp and the contact relationship, of course, into the chewings, you will uh, monitor the, 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 the function. But in that initial setup, how you con what is your, your, your preference? In the initial setup, I tell my lab technician to give me a um, important palatal cusp. So I don't want the flat because otherwise I, I am uh, obstaculate. I really want the mandible to smash on this cusp if I can, because again, if it's class two, this is not possible. I also ask my lab technician to give me, because I make a diagnosis, the people that I'm treating are the horizontal, ruminant. I want them to be a little bit more guided, but never by a steep canine. The canine is, like Emilio will say, is not considered in, out. My canine are always considered in the out motion. So you will see that canine actually is the intelligent person that say, hey, stop, you are going too, too out of out. the way and rebring. But before the canine is this palatal cusp, because if you see the groove, this beautiful enamel groove, it just points in between the lateral and the canine. The problem here is that all the orthodontics are done in a standardized way where this molar does not have the right compensatory because the, the distal vestibular cusp in the normal occlusion should be going down. Instead, they have a different torque. So already kids cannot chew. And so if they don't position they correctly... They, they bring them in, they, they, they take the curve of uh, Wilson away, they make it very flat and that... that That's why for me, uh, orthodontics is fundamental. That's why I want to go back to the development because soon we will not see old people aging edge to edge because they, everybody will be trapped in this wall and everybody will be claustrophobic and we will not see kids. Kids are all class two more because they don't breathe, they don't chew, and if they don't breathe, they cannot chew. And so if they don't chew, the tongue is in the wrong position, so it's a disaster. So yes, we are a population that will have less and less space, extraction of the premolar, but beautiful aligned teeth. So for okay. me, I, I just want to say, I, I would be more, cause, because people say, oh, you treat a, a population that break everything. No, I don't think this population are breaking in my uh, office everything because I give enough freedom 
that they do whatever, but is in harmony with their own mastication. But on the other hand, I am more scared of the kid that is sitting on the TV watching, uh, on the couch watching TV 24 hours with the perfect shoes. I want my shoes, my restoration to live because my kids is play in the field. Function and motion is life. As soon as something is static, it lose. That's why women like me on the uh, they we need to move because osteoporotic is there. So that's why right. we the, nobody would tell you to stay and we not are, to move. So this is beautiful. Definitely, this is what happened when we have people fascinated and actually we extend a little bit today because all the technical issues that we have, uh, we apologize with the people. Um, if it's part of the, uh, the, the lecture, the, the conversation that was mute, we will repost the videos. Uh, we want to say thank you to Francesca for her open mind thinking, everything that yes. he teaches. Actually, honestly, the, every time that I spend with her, I try to suck her brain because honestly, <laughs> sometimes simplicity is important without to be, you can be simple, but not simplistic. And that's the key. Simple is try to make the process to go more efficient, but simplistic is to start paying attention to what is important. And it's something that is really happening in our profession. The motivation about this um, speaker is that it's a really truly story of life, somebody that is making everything better for the community. I feel myself a lot to learn. I want to encourage the dentists that they see in here because I've seen my two things that I want really to learn is have the capability to simplify things because mostly we're coming now with a new transition in our lives and I think we have the opportunity to create value for these uh, physiological things into the patient but still we need to have the capability to make it simple so we get the best of the two conditions. Also okay. to encourage the people to to think open the box and maybe we're going to have the opportunity to have more physiologic uh, treatments for the patient. Try, I think our commitment is with that 90% of the dentists that they don't consider physiology or function as really important part of the treatments. Um, and then we can say just thank you so much, Francesca. We're very looking good. forward for your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank You're you, very Andrew. gracious. Thank for you, Javier. Thank you, thank you for sharing all your uh, uh, invaluable experience with us. Thank you. So we're ready for the new, uh, the next interview. It's gonna be at 1 p.m. We we have all the technical issues, and again, I apologize, but the distance has been making things uh, difficult. So we're gonna have at 1 p.m. Dr. Robert Walker, chiropractor, talking about a concept that he called craniodontics. If we believe that the skull is sold, is one piece, we're going to realize too much more. We're going to realize how the osteopaths and the chiropractors and how they have the capability to move the, the, the skull by itself. And how that is important because sometimes can be some of that what is not allowed the patients to go better. So I see you are one with a different perspective about how is the influence of the cranial release, uh, cranial suture release and cranial compressions into the human body. I Fantastic. see you one. See you all then. Thank Bye -bye. you. I love you, Francesca. See love you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>